So I will call to order the meeting of September 11th of the Legislative Matters Subcommittee of the City Council. And it looks like we're all here. Yes. Thanks, <laughs> Bill. Well, uh, Councilor uh, O'Donnell's here. Councilor Scare's here. And Councilor Jim Nash is here. And I'm here, Councilor Murphy. So um, we have public comment, but we also have a public hearing, and I'm thinking most people are here for either that or to not make a general comment, but comment on the items as they come up in the meeting. Is that the case? We don't need to do public comment first. We'll do it with you folks when we get to the item that you're here for. Um, so minutes of the previous meeting, do we have a motion on those? Move to approve minutes. Second. A second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And we'll give Carolyn another minute. So let's just review the other things we have on our agenda for tonight, because I think a lot of them are at other places. Um, 17.348, ordinance to clarify park, parking lot design when installing photovoltaic canopies. Um, that came to us in July, but it also went elsewhere, correct? Yes, it went to the planning board. It went to the planning oh. board, and they, and they reported back? Yes, they so have. what you have is actually um, a markup of um, okay. the modifications that they voted well, how on. How many of these are public hearing things? All, that packet I gave you was all public hearing. That was separate, that one that's in color. Mm -hmm. Let me just double check them to see what they... Uh, so it's probably the first set of I put them in the order of the public hearing items. Do they have numbers or are they just well let's cables? compare them with our ourselves with the public hearings they have numbers later we have we have ordinance numbers and she's oh, got okay. uh she's got numbers all right for the agriculture tree planting That didn't go to city services. Well, the the first the one that's first in the, in the packet of papers, the seventeen three four eight, mm -hmm. which amends section yeah. three fifty eight point nine. So, number, on today's agenda, numbers five A through G, all I think are were only referred to. For the public hearing. That's all the stuff that was in the public hearing. <clears throat> and it went to planning board and it went to us. G is the taxis. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, oh, there we go. I would just do the public hearing. Mm -hmm. I would just speak in the public hearing and then. Well we're we're just waiting for Carolyn to get her oh, technology okay. working okay. to start the public. It's hearing. And it's working. Okay. And we're just killing time until she got everything going. So now that she has um, a motion to open the public hearing. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. You're on. Okay. So I there are a series of ordinances that were are on this public hearing that went to the planning board. Then there's one three fifty uh, from section chapter three fifty one fifty six. It did not go to the planning board um, because it's not a zoning item. It's a non-zoning item. So I'm going to do the zoning items um, first. Right, first. So the the first one that I had in the order of the public <coughs> hearing, the legal notice, mm -hmm. and I didn't double check. I mean, that's what I sent to Pam to put on the agenda, so I assumed it was in the same order. I hope it is, but it's yeah. um, chapter 357.2, which is a sign ordinance section. Mm -hmm. And um, this is uh, amending our temporary sign um, ordinances 
and along with um, some other um, cleanups, but it's really to um, address a recent court case that came down to um, basically that said that cities and towns can't have to be very careful about regulating content of signs, and um, our ordinance is a little loose on that. So um, to clean it up and make sure that we were consistent with um, the um, recent decisions, um, we've recommended these changes at staff level um, to go through 7.2C, which was about free t um, temporary freestanding signs in residential districts. Um, and simplify it so that it's um, basically moving um, and consolidating the sections about residential signs to make them consistent so they're all, we treat the temporary signs in residential districts all the same. We don't differentiate between what's on the signs or what the content is. Um, and in, in that um, change, what's before you is um, to reduce the um, current um, sign size from 60, because they were sort of all over the place, the different sign sizes for temporary signs, reduce it to four square feet, seven, um, I'm, sorry. <clears throat> I'm sorry, as part of moving 72 um, to um, 72 C, moving it to 73, which is what, it's all stricken on this first page. And it goes over the second page to 7.3. Um, and as part of that move, um, uh, condense it and just um, simplify it and specify that sign shall not exceed um, six, move it from six. Originally, what was proposed in front of you was three. The planning board recommended four square feet and shall be on private property, um, no closer than five feet to any property lines. Um, Sign shall be not be any higher than four feet above ground. That's not a change. Um, that the section from three to four was modified was recommended to be modified by the planning board because in the paragraph 70K, it was already re recommended to go from six to four feet. So instead of having a three foot sign and a four foot sign, just make them all four feet. That's what the planning board recommended. Um, and then to clarify that um, you can have two, uh, it expands the total number of temporary signs um, and temporary meaning less than 90 days um, on a lot. Um, so that is that cleanup. So um, it used to say one sign per candidate slash cause. So that language is removed, so now it, and now it just says two temporary signs. So does that mean you can only have two signs on per lot at any time, regardless of how many offices are being run for? Um, and you could have two signs for the same candidate? Yes. So the idea is that we can't regulate what's on the sign. So we can't say, oh, that's an election sign. That's OK. That one over here is an ad for someone's home business that's not okay <coughs> if it's temporary. So we have to say it's a sign, a sign is a sign. So no matter what, two signs, less than 90 days, and that's it. Okay. So just to clarify, uh, um, if you wanted to show your support for three candidates, that would not be possible? Um, it could be possible. If you can consolidate them onto two signs, make your own sign. Then yeah, they get too big. What's that? Then they get too big. <laughs> you know, because they can only be four square. But I'm sorry, like if you wanted to have, if there were three candidates that you wanted to support, they each had their own line signs. Right. You couldn't put three separate signs. Well, I, I, the other question, I mean, I, it seems like in some ways you're making it more permissive and in some ways it's, it's more restrictive. Right. Um, I, I've said this before, I, mean, I really feel that even before the case you were talking about, there were clear constitutional issues about free speech, which it's important to protect, and in particular political free speech. 
and I just have some reservations about the restriction. <coughs> I guess I would ask, you know, what is the compelling public interest in, in restricting sign display in this way? What do we hope, what do we hope to achieve? What's, why would we do it? What do we gain? Well, this is for residential districts, so yeah. by not restricting signs, then you could have any number of signs on all residential lots throughout the city. So there's, um, there's visual clutter, there's um, trash potentially if they get blown around. Um, so there's, and we treat residential districts differently from commercial districts and commercial speech can be regulated differently than um, other speech. So um, the, the idea is really these are residential districts and if we're allowing signs, we can't differentiate between you know, a three month election cycle and say you can have 20 during the election cycle but only none or one during the off so it is a balance I mean you're right you have to yeah. say what's appropriate if it's appropriate is it appropriate all year long anytime I feel yeah and you know I think if you look around you'll still see and maybe maybe I'll agree with you that it's it's visual clutter you'll still see signs for certain candidates that are put up sort of even in protests that maybe their candidate didn't win so they keep their sign on their lawn. So enforceability is the other one. Right. Um, you know, I'm not sure the building commissioner is going to go around and remove or whoever lawn signs. Right. But it's like even, I'd say, say it's even more difficult if to we, to the current system that we have. Okay. Because it differentiates between political candidate, you know, candidate signs. So yeah. if someone comes and says, you have your sign, well, it's free speech if I can get to have my sign up. but. Yeah. This way, we're just sort of neutralizing everything and saying all signs are going to be treated the same way. Yeah. Show me that your sign hasn't been up for yeah nine, more well, less than ninety days. I guess I feel oh I, I don't want to. Just my final comment would be I feel that this is in the category of things that is self-regulating. It's sort of like if you had an ordinance requiring people to, to mow their lawns for a certain number of days, that might be good, but I mean it's sort of like. The way that's actually regulated is it's kind of socially regulated. You know, people will say, oh, well, get on their neighbor's case and say, what are you doing? Why don't you take your silly sign down? Or why don't you mow your lawn? Um, I, I just have reservations about restricting political speech to, to two lawn signs. Like, pick the two candidates you want to support. I feel it's an artificial restriction that doesn't serve any purpose that is justified. Well, we'll have uh, Alan here later. We can ask. Um, so, along those lines, I feel like the the previous system, while you could have you could have as many different candidates that you want to support possible on your lawn, it it did sort of self regulate since you were only allowed to have one per candidate cause whatever. That in and of itself limits the amount that you were going to have, and it's also a limited time period. So. Um, I would agree that I feel like restricting, making people choose which two candidates causes they feel like they want to support enough at that moment does feel overly restricted. Um, can, can you, you could go out and switch them every couple hours. Yes. And only have two at a time. So, so we talked about, you mentioned something about having it be like a seasonal 90 day that maybe for 90 days that restriction gets lifted, you know, because we have an election in 90 days from election, you know, it's kind of, I don't want to say anything goes, but that, um, that you know, it goes to five signs or something like that. So it, it allows people a plenty of free speech. And then beyond that, you know, outside of that window, then, you know, we send the building inspector out to go collect the signs. Can I ask one more question? Please. Also, the three days after the election, Laws, we, we had to take, they had to be removed three days after an election. That is also been removed. Um, which I feel like if we're trying to keep down the sign clutter, wouldn't that be a more important thing to keep? Um, it goes along with the concept of we can't, we're not supposed to be able to look at a sign and say whether it belongs there. So um, based on the content of the sign. So I'm not sure that was effective. 
we ever enforced anyway. I mean, I think none of these are, it's hard to enforce any of these. I mean, people put up multiple signs for their candidate in their own yard, too, you see that. Um, but I, I, the, the, the reason why I was removed is because the idea is we're just neutralizing everything. So it doesn't matter whether there's an election or not. I mean, I suppose you could say this ordinance is effective, you know, for the months, you know, excluding the month of October to November <laughs> or whatever. Um, and then, and so it's only effective 11 months of the year or something, whatever it is. But, um, uh, I, I mean, I, the, the, the idea is it's supposed to be content neutral. So we, so having, saying that it's after, three days after the election means you have to decide whether that was a candidate, a sign that was about a candidate. Well, what if it, if the language was 90 days after installation or three days after the appropriate election. Mm -hmm. Any more questions on this one at the moment? No. Anybody here in the public to speak about signs? Because now would be the time to no comment pro or con about signs from anyone that's here. All right. I have one additional comment. So you have this, um, you you know, this was advertised as um, two signs. Um, you could potentially, I mean, if, if two just seems too few, you could also play with that language, you know, come up with another number. There's nothing necessarily magic about that except to keep it, you know, limited. So that's another something. Right, any other? We done with? We're done with this as a committee, and nobody here from the public pro or con is here to comment on this one. So we will move on to the next one, which is three fifty eight dash seven. The number is 17.25. And for our, yeah, our ordinance number for it is different. Line them up if you want me to. Yeah. One of the numbers. Yeah. Um, for reference. And this deals with parking, a special permits required for parking spaces that are not contiguous to the educational use. So, Carolyn, you want to? Right. So, this the is, um, uh, it, this is just a cleanup. Um, we, um, there was, an, there was an allowance for a special permit for educational uses, but we can't require educational uses to go through a special permit process because educational uses are exempt from zoning for, for use. So we can require site plans and things like that for educational use, but um, we can't require special permits. So it's just um, eliminating the special permit language for educational uses. And it's been in there for a long time. <coughs> Any questions from the committee on this one? One quick one. So there's no situation in town that's prompting this. It's simply that it seemed inconsistent with the rest. Well, it's not legal, um, and it's just been sort of one of those things where it was we realized it a couple of years ago, and there just wasn't really. It was just sort of put on the checklist of things okay. to eliminate. All right. So there's no questions from anyone here on this one. How about members of the public? Any questions on the parking? Pro or con? All right. Then we will move on to our next one, which is, and, and again, the zoning. This is, this is more zoning with regards to um, Accessory solar photovoltaic ground mounted on a parcel with any building or use between 8 kilowatts or 100 kilowatts, but no more than 200% of the annual projected electric use of the non PV building use. Um, you want to go? Yeah. This down? is 17 B49. Okay. So, um, this is a provision to, um, so um, when we first adopted, I think 2011 um, ordinances 
to um, define photovoltaic arrays, large scale, roof mounted, accessory, non accessory. Um, there was a lot of discussion about which, di which districts um, sh these large scale, non accessory, um, meaning just um, energy generation, um, uh, not supporting a house or another business use. Uh, which district um, <coughs> would be appropriate um, to allow. And we've done some tweaking since 2011 when this first was adopted, but at that time it, there was a specific concern about not opening up the meadows, the Special Conservancy District, to allow large-scale um, ground-mounted systems because that was our most viable farmland and we didn't, um, as a community, want to just turn that over and potentially have a wholesale conversion of um, a lot of those um, parcels. Um, so there were some a little limited allowances in the Special Conservancy District. Um, and since then, there's been some interest in maybe tweaking that to allow um, some modest development, um, but not again, not opening the the door to just allowing it anywhere and everywhere. There are multiple problems with that. It's in the floodplain, plus it would require more utility infrastructure in the floodplain. So you have to, you know, unless you were on a utility, um, you know, corridor, you'd be um, seeing new utility pole construction pop up in the meadows. So um, the proposal was to allow um, where there's uh, initially where farming um, agricultural parcels weren't viable or as viable as other parcels allow some small amount of development for PV. Um, the way their ordinance was originally drafted to you um, included uh, four provisions that should be met in order to obtain a special permit from the planning board. Um, this went to the planning board and they felt that there were two of the top two that are highlighted in green were not appropriate or um, were unnecessary because there was still a limiting factor in the um, final two bullet points. So originally the language says solar voltaic non-accessory ground mounted is allowed only when the following four conditions exist. The location of the system has not been in agricultural production for at least 25 years and the location is over soils that are not considered prime agricultural soils as listed by the NRCS and Department of Agricultural Resources, and the panels are located within 100 feet of a power line or pole, and the system will not exceed 8 kW. So the planning board felt like the bottom two bullets were enough to limit the total um, amount of farmland that could be converted in this sort of first incremental step towards allowing this in the Special Conservancy District. So um, that's how they're recommending it to you all. Questions on this one? Councilor Nash. So, eight kilowatts. So, how big of a an array is that? <laughs> it depends. I mean, typically, right, right now, what we're seeing is um, for some of the that's big enough for sure to accommodate um, a single family house and probably a little bit more. But the technology is changing all the time. So, I I can't quantify it for you in terms of number of panels. It's not big. Okay. Um, so I see, uh, uh, you know, if I drive around town and I see arrays on people's roofs and um, on their barns or in their yards. So that's typically the size of what would be for a small house, for a typical household. So something in that range. We're not yeah. talking about something, right. we're not talking about a half an acre. We're not talking about like the landfill or anything. Okay, like we're talking about, okay. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, I have a few more. Please, I'll go right in. Okay, um, so how do these arrays perform in floodplain conditions? So part of the reason we're not building in the floodplain is because um, it's gonna, we know it's gonna flood every so many years and that um, have we so how do these arrays perform is that do they need to be installed differently and um, do and under do they meet the standards of like a hundred year flood a 500 year flood I mean 
they'd have to meet the standards. Um, uh, you'd still you'd still go to the building department and you'd still have to comply with construction within the floodplain. You'd also have to get a permit from the conservation commission. So it's not just it's so there there are three elements. You need to meet zoning. You still need to go to the conservation commission and still meet the building code requirements for putting structures into the flood. Well, I, so my question is that if we have a big flood and somebody puts an array out by the river, are they going to get washed away? Um, or if they're up high enough, do it, has that, I mean, if something's, you know, 12 feet in the air and typically, you know, the 100-year yeah. flood is just, you know, five feet over that land. The panel would um, be above the flood elevation. The post that it's on would not be, obviously, because it goes through the ground. Right. And it has to be anchored so that it can withstand the forces of the flood um, floodwaters. Okay. Um, that's that would that comes under the building code review. Okay. Thank you. Other questions from Carolyn? How do you feel about the first two bullets and whether they're necessary? I know the planning board said that. Um. Well, I guess um, I think that. Um, the last two bullets are really important. Um, I think that there was a debate about, well, what's the standard? How can you tell if it's in, um, you know, if it's prime agricultural soil? That is a standard. So, you know, we're not concerned that there would be any kind of gray area about whether it's prime agriculture or not. Um, the board felt uncomfortable about it, despite that. Um, and the 25 years, they thought, was a really long time to to have to tabulate you know, how long something hasn't been. I guess our, uh, from a staff perspective, our initial um, thinking was, you know, we it does make sense to allow people who can't, aren't using their land for farming of any sort to maybe convert it. Um, but let's take a tiny step first. And so, uh, but at the same time, um, I think this still, limits, you know, even with the planning board recommendation, I think it still is a modest, you know, first And step. being within 100 feet of a power line is very limiting for a yeah. lot of the agricultural land. Yeah. That's not very far. Right. Sure. So um, how easy, is it possible to return the land back to being uh, farmland once, you know, 20 years go by, the, the PV system doesn't work so well, you pull it out and then you can farm again, or are, are we are we creating the conditions for uh, the farming to stop? That's my question. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think there's, uh, right now, apparently from what I hear, I haven't done my own research, there's money to be made um, that may be more viable than in agricultural production. So I think there are a lot of incentives out there to get people to convert. I don't know how long that return is going to be there for PD. So it's hard for me. But it, so the question is, you know, so once you have these, the, the, uh, is it the pilot, whatever it is, what is it you put in the ground? The, the footing? The footings. Once you put the footings in, that I mean, you got to pull them back out to farm, or maybe you don't. Maybe they're down ten feet, or, or I don't know. <laughs> maybe there's a way to work that. I, I just think that having um, uh, some way so that the farmland can be restored at some point um, would be great. Is your question whether they inherently have a negative impact on the farmland just by installing them, or the removal? Or like by not working the land in a way to keep it fertile. Well, it, by it, by installing stuff on property that's been farmland, we kind of take it out of the realm of being farmland right. because we damage the the topsoil and you put stuff in the soil. So that's really my question: How easy would it be to just pull that stuff out and turn it back into workable? Or are we going down the road of, well, you know, we that property is no longer farmland now because we put it in the system. Does it damage the soil? Um, so, 
You know, I think it probably depends on how many of these go in. I think this is a very small, this would be small scale in the scheme of things. So, you know, if you've, but that may be different if, if the next um, iteration of this is to open up and to allow bigger systems. Right, right. Um, that might, I would think, I think that's a valid question. Um, and the state is working apparently on some, um, Technology to try to allow dual use um, of agriculture and um, PV. Um, so I think there's definitely an interest in seeing if that uh, can move forward. The planning department has a target percentage for conservation land. You have nothing like that for agricultural land, do you? Like an ideal mix that we want to have in the city of Northampton. How much agricultural land we want to have? I can't think of one off the top of my head, but um, I'm just curious. Yeah. Thank you. So we done with our questions here. Then anyone that's in the audience, yep, please just <coughs> give us a, give us your name and come on up so we can get you on the. Uh, Wayne Tebow, eight thirty Chesterfield Road, Florence. Mm -hmm. I've been. Uh, this, this issue concerns me. I own land in the meadows, about a five acre piece. I grow hay and straw down there, and uh, I, don't, uh, I, I, lease, I don't even lease it. I let Jasky do it. I used to grow corn and so forth. Mm -hmm. I, I applied for a permit to put solar down there. Now, to fill you in on the size of an AKW, an AKW would go on one pedestal, one round pedestal, in the ground and probably be about from here to here. That's all. Now you take a large scale that's down the road from me on Chesterfield Road, horses, there's a horse farm there, horses go under it, animals graze under it. So there's really no difference because it's up off the ground. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't affect anything. Uh, I went to the planning board meeting and, and the, the, the ones that came up, the 25 years, and about the soils, the, uh, when I filed for a permit, I said it was, it was going to be placed on a non-agricultural piece of my property. There's a natural hill there, one of the highest hills on Riverbank Road. I was going to put it right there, a nice sunny area. And when the 25, uh, so it's never been farmed in 25 years, what that's got to do with it, I don't know. Because we built the ball fields down in, uh, uh, Florence Meadows, or Florence Fields. We've got 88 panels on top of the two buildings down there. 88 panels. That's probably up around 25 kW. That's a lot of power, more than any house in Northampton, believe me. And I don't know. I don't know how that went for special permit or what. I haven't heard about it. Possibly it did. Did it go for special permits, or the city doesn't have to do that? Um, it doesn't matter who's applying. Rooftop systems don't require. So, um, so, approval. so any big roof you got, you can yeah. put as much as you want. Then. As far as as far as that zoning down there, when I looked at it in the map, it, is it Special Conservancy? It uh, says SC. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, Special Conservancy is where I am. The power that feeds that building is 250 feet away, and I don't know what the 100 feet's got to do with it. Because if somebody wanted to put it in further down, they'd have to pay the utility for the power poles. Everything you do down there goes underground, so you can plow it, you can do everything. Nothing's going to be displayed or anything, or any hazards. And uh, so I don't know if this, this 100 feet's got to do with it, because when I look at my situation, I have power down there, and my power, when I put it in down there, if I put the solar in, I'd have to raise the pan the, the meter because it's actually, when it was done, it was legal, but it'd have to go above the flood line. The bottom of the panels normally, or the electric, actually the panels aren't a problem because they're, they're, they're pretty well weatherproof. It's, it's the, the components where they tie in, so the box and everything where all the wires come, that would have to definitely be above, roughly it's 125 elevation down. So you'd have to have that up in the air. Because there's a house that's reconstructed down the road, they haven't moved their meter up. 
and the construction they put on there, they, they pulled the building up for that for that elevation. It would be the same for me to follow that, have to go to the conservation board and so forth. So I, I, I just don't know, oh, oh, as far as that goes, 100 feet, 100 feet is nothing. And why that 100 feet is there, I don't know. There's, there's, there's power right down the whole road. I got 650 feet of frontage on the road. There's power poles. But if I wanted to set that back closer to the river, because I'd get more sun, I'd be over 100 feet. Where I'm, where I'm setting it now, I'm kind of in between two poles. That's roughly within it, probably over a little over 100 feet or 100 feet. And I just don't understand because, like I said, there's there's nothing in any building codes. If you build a house, you want to be a thousand feet up in the woods, as long as you run the power up there, you can do it. So I don't know why that hundred feet is there. And I, I question the planning department and people before I fill the permit out. This has been going on for two years. The permit was filled out last December and I was denied because I wasn't using the power there. I went to the Agricultural Commission, went to their meetings, and they agreed with me that they had no problem and they were gonna to recommend to the planning department that, that putting in a small scale, a small scale is under 10 kW. So putting in a small scale unit to use at your home off-site there's no problem at all. They were against the large scale people. So really, I, I don't know of anybody else, of all the meetings I went to in the last couple of years and everything, or involvement, that was looking to put a, put a solar array down there. When you go down on the Riverbank Road and take a left towards the Coolidge Bridge, there's a large array. There's probably 50 panels ground mounted. That special concerns. But it's not, but I think that the area he's in, he's just slightly above the floodplain. But it makes no difference. I'd have to raise it above the floodplain. But that went in like 50 panels. That's a pretty big, that's a lot more than 8KW or 10KW. Anyone else want to comment either <coughs> pro or con on this order? Questions from up here? Well, Mike, Mike, can I follow up on sure. what Mr. Tebow raised? Why, why, why is the hundred foot <coughs> restriction included? Um, you know, whether it's hundred feet or something slightly different, I think the idea is that um, we don't want poles to be sprinkled throughout the meadow. New poles, it then it opens up for potentially for more use. Right now, a lot of um, I mean, it's open farmland now, so um, uh, I, I have to check about what the range is in terms of how, how far apart you can be before you need to put another pole. So if you want to set way back, let's see, towards the river, which may not be so great for resource, other resources either, um, you might need an intermediate pole you know, to get to the main pole, I don't know. So um, the idea really is that we want to leave it as um, open for farming as possible. And that, you know, then other users along the way could potentially tap in, and we have a, we already have an issue with um, making sure that we don't have new temporary residential structures going in and just tapping into poles. But, it's, it, but it wouldn't be used for farming, presumably. It would, it would be used for a different purpose. The pole, the utility poles. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. So. Right. So the reason why we don't want poles is just why don't why don't we want poles there? Well, because mm -hmm. one, it changes the landscape. Two, it potentially changes the use. So it's not just PV connections, but you know we've found over the years uh, people can then go directly to the, the utility company to tap in. They don't have to come to the city for use. Um, so we've also had illicit connections to other poles. Um, so, are, sorry. Yeah. But those are going to be legal anyway. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. So we're really concerned about 
creating the practical opportunity for illicit connections. Well, and also the change in the landscape to see utility poles pop up. In mm -hmm. Okay. Well, well, isn't a photovoltaic display a change in the landscape yeah, pretty significant? That's what I would think. Can I just one, one last comment? Sure. My service down there now is underground. If I, if I if I was so, what's it make? What difference does it make? Two hundred feet. It's underground, and if and when if I put the units in, whatever pole I come off, because I may have to increase the service size or I have to raise it. It's going to be underground. Nobody's going to see it. It's all underground. Is there any restriction on putting? Wires underground? Oh, you, under this? No, but I don't think the utility the, company's putting poles underground. They're putting the poles up. You have, have to get a wired permit from the city of Northampton. And, and he has to inspect it. He has to see that I put it down three feet roughly. It's in conduit and everything else. You have to follow the mass electrical code. Okay. Councilor? So this is for Mr. Tebow. So under this, the way it's written right now, would you be able to put a an array on that little hill that you're no. talking about? No, because, because that, you because don't have the distance. No, because I'm with with the, the way the code is now. Mm -hmm. It won't allow me to you to take that power and use it off my my home usage. No, but I'm saying with this new language that we're considering right here. Right. With, you know, it would allow you, it, is that that little rise that you're talking about where you were talking about putting the array in, would that be within 100 feet of a power line? Not, probably not quite because I'm between, even though I'm off the road short distance, right. the poles are probably 300 feet apart. But are you within, feet? so no. I don't think it's the poles, it's just the, if the line. If no, but you've got to go to a pole to get to a line. Right, but I, if I was reading this here, I would say, well, I'm 100 feet of a line. Yes, you have to run 150 feet across the hypotenuse to get to the pole, but is your hill within 100 feet of that? Oh, yes, within, a, within the line itself, yeah, not within the attachment. Of the right, power. right, right. Because my sense is that a lot of this is, is being pushed by your request. And uh, um, so I, I'd like to see well, it be possible. <laughs> I, I, I've been in energy savings since the 70s. I've been involved in a lot of things, saving energy. I th did a lot for the state, everything, every, everybody else. I understand it fully. I have all kinds of licenses. I'm a master electrician. I have a refrigeration contractor's license, so I'm familiar with heat pumps, all that stuff. I have 20, I have like my own home I built in 70. I have probably 30 years of records of every day of the weather, how much oil I consume, and so forth. This this is also a thing with all the grant money we got in a green community to help me burn less oil and use some solar. I own about 55 acres in Northampton. It's the only place where it's really so solar efficient for me. I'd rather have it in my own home, but I can't put it there. Too many trees. Alrighty, we done with with this one from Public Accounts. You got another? Well, I guess we'll continue to discuss it after the hearing. Mm -hmm. All right. And nobody else out there is here for this one, so. Uh, let's move on to the next one. <coughs> Parking uh, lots. So the next one is also was, um, a section in the um, parking um, where there's a requirement for you plant so many trees um, per parking space that you have and plant uh, when you're developing a site and plant trees in, in the aisle, parking aisle, um, in between, sorry, in between the parking aisles, so the medians. Um, so the, the, um, the concept was to, um, if you're going to do canopy array over a parking lot, um, then um, remove the tree planting requirement for that section of the parking lot over which the canopy um, is located because you're covering it with a PV array anyway. 
Um, so uh, the added text would be the calculation for determining the total number of trees required for um, planting in one section would be, would um, you'd subtract that, um, that uh, number, you wouldn't have to use that number um, that's under the canopy. And then the other section F, 9F, would be um, that you would, um, the total number would be um, recalculated for just the open parking area. Um, the planning board um, did not like this ordinance <laughs> and they recommend just um, not adopting it because they felt that um, trees um, could be planted elsewhere on the site if it's not under the canopy, still use that same calculation for the total number of parking spaces you're creating to help continue to offset that heat island effect and um, um, potentially you know, screen, help screen a canopy. So um, they um, were not supportive of this. If we, if we took their recommendation, how much would it negatively impact the addition of photovoltaics to parking, mm -hmm. in your judgment? So, or is that hard <laughs> it's to hard say? to say. We haven't had, we've, our first request for one has just come in. And in fact, um, it's going to the planning board on Thursday. Um, and it's a it's a pretty small one, so there isn't a requirement to offset. There are already trees on that around that parking lot, so it's not affecting yeah. that one at all. Um, but you know the places where you you'd want to you know the idea is we'd hope that large parking lots would uh, uh -huh. have these, and so I don't know what the effect of that would be. Is there language in here that uh, that makes it clear that we're talking about trees are within the parking lot itself you know what I mean or is it the case of, like what you said like they can be planted anywhere on the on the property so the way the ordinance reads is you need to break up if you have a parking lot of 75 spaces or more you need to break those up with planted islands so on those islands are where the trees would go uh, um, and then there's a separate calculation for every 15 parking spaces, you need one tree. So it could be the case that if you have 30 parking spaces, you can plant two trees outside on the end, and that takes care of the two required for the 30 car parking space. Uh -huh. If you have a much bigger one, um, the idea is not only to plant, but break up that parking um, uh -huh. um, area by planting. And we want to plant trees that don't grow really high because they'll block the PV array. It all depends on the orientation of the site. Well, and every other one usually is dead, so they don't live very well in park all that stuff. Could the language simply say, in the case of spaces that are covered by photovoltaic canopies, the trees can go elsewhere besides the island? I think by leaving the language out, the board was assuming that's how it would um, be dealt with anyway. You still are required to plant the total number of parking spaces, but you obviously can't plant them where the canopy is. You just put them somewhere else on the site. So you feel the ordinance would permit that? The yeah. Words? yeah. Oh, really? I but thought the planning board was okay. Though. No, the planning board was, uh, wasn't was okay for saying you have to break up your you, you don't have to calculate the total number of trees for the area over which the canopy is located. Um, so if you had 30 spaces that are covered by canopy, you have to figure out where to put those two trees. You might not be able to put them right there where the canopy is, but you should put them somewhere else. We're good with this one. Any public comment on this one? <coughs> I have one more thought. So if we're, would this be, Disincentivizing putting trees into on the property. The way it's written, yeah. it would. It, I wouldn't be a disincentive because you'd have you could only do you still that have if the you put a canopy number of trees. on. You still so if this ordinance were adopted as presented, yeah. Um, it, it's it was seen as an incentive. Um, to for the for installation of canopies 
I don't know how much of an incentive, but um, we just thought it was a beneficial trade-off. We'd love for you to put a canopy on your parking area. Right. Um, so for that area, don't worry about the trees. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. All right, we're good with this one, and we didn't have any public comment on this one, right? No. All right. Um, the next one is for new buildings being designed to accommodate solar installations, whether you put them up or not. So this is a new subsection um, that in the site plan approval. So it's only with people who are have projects that trigger site plan. So there are certain uses in the code that tr automatically trigger site plan and then projects over 2,000 square feet that are not single family homes. Um, for new buildings and additions, the applicant must show that the building is designed to accommodate solar power, power installation. This is met by showing that the roof design can support solar panels and that the roof orientation, condo, and electric service will be incorporated so that the installation could be added either at the time of construction or at any point thereafter. Alternatively, the applicant may show the site is designed to accommodate solar with conduit to be located to accommodate the ground, a ground system. The planning board may waive this for green roofs or if the applicant provides information to show that either the building mounted or ground mounted systems are impractical due to site constraints or orientation. So is this going to permit the planning board to say you can't orientate your building this way, you have to put it this way so it's better for solar, or you can still put your building where you want to put it, but you have to make it stout enough to hold the photovoltaic array. Right? So, yeah, I mean, the I guess um, the answer would be um, that you would have to show that the building is um, sturdy enough to um, accommodate rooftop system or ground mounted. Um, and unless, you know, otherwise. So if, if it can be oriented, then build your um, build your um, building in that orientation. So it is possible the planning board could say, redo your site design so that the building is more suitable for solar. Um, yeah. But isn't it any level of suitability? As long as the roof can bear an array, Right. Wouldn't have to be in, in the ideal orientation, would it? No. So I mean, you like could simply show that the construction of materials, the way you're building it and designing it, is, you know, could accommodate a race. It's not saying you have to put them on. I guess I don't, yeah. I guess I don't understand enough about how to build houses. I mean, are there many houses that can't support a solar array? I wouldn't and, want and to remember, it's not going to be, it's not going to be a single family home. Uh -huh. It could be multi family. Uh -huh. um, or commercial building because this is only triggered by site plan review <coughs> this requirement so this and this language actually was developed by the building commissioner mm -hmm. so um, you know and he's much more comfortable with what the building code requires now with in terms of the um, you know, the, the standards and has um, actually pitched this thing this is easily um, accomplished this is something easy to accomplish it doesn't seem burdensome. He didn't think it was. Additionally, we already require certain orientation for buildings, and just in that your front door has to face the street. And in certain so, circumstances, right? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, the thing about it gets me is that the, the roof design can support solar, and, and that the roof orientation oh, would, it would be with the way the building's facing. Uh, right. Then, or if you didn't want, I'm sorry, I was just going to say the alternative is the ground mounted system. So if you really had to have your building with a roof angled in a certain way that was not um, conducive to solar access, you could alternatively show that there's area on the ground to do ground mounted. And it doesn't say how much, it says the site is suitable for that or the building is suitable for that. How much would it detract from your goal if roof orientation were 
stricken from these proposed additions, but the rest yes. were left. Would that be, would that defeat the purpose, or is that, you think so? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the, uh, I mean, you'll, I think um, there are people, I'm going to pick on Chris Mason, because I think I've heard him say this several times, is that, you know, there are lots of houses that were built in, in um, different times that if they just oriented, you know, slightly in the other way, it could be a whole different story for um, solar access. And that um, it's that, you know, it's the thought process of mm -hmm. looking at all the aspects of the site and potential reduction in carbon footprint that mm -hmm. should go into planning and designing mm -hmm. a building. So a situation could be we have a, uh, a home that faces the street, it's facing south, and that typically the, 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 the homes on the street have that front-facing pediment like this, and that this requirement would say, no, you actually need to have like, um, like one of the more federal styles I'm making. I, I don't know. <laughs> but with the roof coming down like a colonial, all right, so that it's facing southward. So that now we, we, we're kind of encouraging a different look in the facade on the street by um, asking that, this, that that orientation be met. Um, I think for, you know, if, if a home is facing eastward or westward, it's not such a big deal. We have a lot of homes that are at angles, which is what I think Chris is talking about, you know, facing southwest. So you really get morning sun or late afternoon sun or whatever, and it's like, where do you put the, the array? Um, so, um, that, so there's that. And then there's this, we kind of create this either or. So, well, if, so it, it kind of, so if you have an east-west home, you're, you're okay. But if you have a south-facing or a north-facing home, you now have this issue of, now you gotta figure out where to, how you can fit an array in your yard. And then we're starting to say, well, and, and now we're encroaching on the, the open space. So I just think it needs to be thought out a little more. That's because of all of the either ors. Yeah. And I'm just thinking people who may want to orient on structure and a lot to take advantage of a view. Being told, well, you can't have it there because it's facing the wrong way. You've got to put it over here, which seems to me a little bit intrusive. Also, Again, this isn't a single or two family house situation. This is if you trigger site plan approval. Mm -hmm. And it also talks about for new building and additions. How big an addition triggers this? 2,000 square feet or more. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing a commercial addition of 2,000 square feet or more. Any uh, other questions? Any questions from the public on this one? Yeah, just yeah. one question. I'm a little mixed up. I, I understand a 2,000 square feet, but it's not for a single family home because, I mean, there are homes that are over 2,000 square feet. Yeah, this is, in the site, this is in the site plan review section. Okay. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, please. Uh, my name is Elon Tierney. I'm uh, part of the Central Business Architecture Committee. I'm also an architect at Cunewell Architects. Um, my understanding is that this is just asking the applicant to consider where solar orientation is possible, whether on the building itself or on the site, but not requiring that solar panels be installed. Is that correct? Right. I think that that's a good idea, that we should always be considering opportunities <coughs> for energy efficiency like solar panels. No, I just want to be sure that you would not be granted site plan review if the planning board decided you should face your building in another direction to, to make the solar better. I suppose that there could be an opportunity where that comes up and um, the building isn't adequate for solar orientation for one reason or the other that you'd have to show somewhere on your site that it was possible. And I guess, is there is there a possibility that you could request a waiver if it's just simply not possible? 
Yeah, it does go on to say, uh, planning board may waive this requirement for green moves or if the applicant proves, provides information to show that, that either building mounted or, or ground mounted systems are impractical due to the site constraints or orientation. Other, any other questions? Questions? Anything else from the public? All right. Moving along. Um, Large so scale ground mounted. So the last piece of this sort of PV packet, I believe, is um, to just clarify. There's some districts in which we, it's silent on ground mounted large scale ground mounted array so mostly it's in the um, um, in the industrial districts so there are other provisions for um, power stations or private generators um, so this is really just to add to the definition of solar uh, photovoltaic that if a system that the a PV system could be classified or considered um, as a private utility substation or similar facility if the table of uses is, is silent on PV as a separate line item. So it would be zoned as a substation if it's that big? Well, it could be considered, you know, if you're doing a large ground mounted system, you're generating power for the grid. Mm -hmm. So it could be, you could interpret that as being a, a substation. So if there's not any other specified language about solar arrays, then this just clarifies that the you know we could interpret it that, that, that you would could fall interpret that it that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Questions on this? No, no? Mr. Tebow, <coughs> question on this one? Yeah. The landfill considered that? Because that's a large scale. Three point three uh, megawatts. How's the landfill classified? That's pretty big. Please. Um, the landfill is in the Water Supply Protection District. It got a site plan approved from the planning board. It was specifically identified in the Water Supply Protection District as an allowed use with site plan approval from the planning board. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it went through site plan review. <coughs> Other questions? No. no? Any other questions from the public on this one? All right. Now we're on to central business architecture. Um, is this part of your? Are you putting said you want to put? Um. It, it, it's up to you all if you feel like you still want to take public comment on that whole package that's fine we do have to tell you that I have to scoot at like 6 30 so <laughs> um, if you wanted to keep the public hearing open on either one it's, I mean it's fine so you don't care whether we do one big public hearing or do two um, no as long as you officially open um, if you open I don't know if you specifically opened the one on 156, but um, it certainly passed the advertised time, so you could yeah. definitely it's open it. Open public hearing on. All right. Well, first we should uh, close the first public hearing because we. Said we keep them both open and then close them the same. It's really up to you. We, we certainly could. Do it. Can you think of any reason why we want to take any more input on the PV stuff? Yeah. No, we still could if we want. No, we can just, we can keep discussing it. But. Right. All right. So I take back my first <laughs> motion, and I instead move to close the public hearing on the day. So we have a second for that. Any discussion on that? All in favor? Aye. Uh, All right. And we can open a second public hearing on <coughs> the central business architectural district changes. We have a motion on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I move to open the second public hearing. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Okay, so in this, 12 minutes. <laughs> this is a change to um, the specific section that um, uh, allows exemptions from popping up to the full committee for review. So there's a series of, um, so in the central business ordinance, architecture ordinance, there um, <coughs> are 
certain cases in which um, projects either can be reviewed at the staff level or um, if they're not exempt, they can move out to public hearing with the Central Business Architecture Committee. And um, <coughs> in 156.5, um, um, it stipulates there um, about 18 or 19 items that are, sorry, 20 items that um, are exempt or um, could be considered exempt. And so this provision that the changes proposed um, are to clarify um, or to add, to move a couple of the exemptions up from um, exempt status by staff review to a little bit elevated position of um, review that mirrors what we do with the Historic District Commission where there's a staff and a committee, subcommittee review um, without a full-blown public hearing for a project. Um, so the way the proposed changes um, are written are that the Central Business Architecture Committee um, chair or alternate committee member and director of Office and Planning and Sustainability or its designee <coughs> shall authorize a subcommittee or agent to issue a certificate of non-applicability under this section for the following. And it pulls two items that were originally item 12 and 17 that were exempt to this other um, review. The, and they, they are the reconstruction substantially similar in exterior design and appearance of a building structure or exterior architecture feature damaged by or destroyed by fire, storm, or other disaster, provided that the reconstruction has begun within a year and carried forward with due diligence. The other um, item to pull up to this other sort of subcommittee review would be replacement of a window with a new window of the same general design and appearance. <coughs> but a change in um, materials when the subcommittee finds that the new windows are identical in size to the old windows and replacements shall not alter sills, lintels, or tops and do not and shall not incorporate mirror glass. Um, uh, and then, sorry, there's a third item. Restoration of features of the same general design and appearance as existed historically, the subcommittee finds that there is adequate evidence to believe that the restoration is historically accurate and the restoration will not damage other historic features nor alter the historic character of the building. <clears throat> and then um, this language is already in there but a little bit modified. Such certification may also be requested but is not required for any of the exempt items in subsection C below. Um, and then um, there's just a clarification of one of the exempt items that storm doors and storm windows, adding the word storm, um, shall be exempt um, as well, um, along with window air conditioners and top solar panels that are not visible from the street. Um, so just clarifying when those exemptions are and then correcting in item 11, roof colors, paint, stain colors, and paint, painting of painted masonry um, is exempt as well. So the idea of pulling these things up to um, a little bit more careful review is that um, it takes a little bit more subjectivity. I mean, these, these items are a little bit more subjective than some of the other items in the, on the exempt list. And um, um, so um, this was put forward w after a discussion with um, the Central Business Architecture Committee in reviewing some um, occasional instances where things had slipped through um, the cracks at the initial staff review. So um, the committee um, and staff, frankly, felt that um, it was appropriate to pull those things out that were a little slightly more object, uh, subjective <coughs> and um, have them um, have a, a slightly elevated review. Mm -hmm. Elsewhere. Um. It also, I guess strictly speaking, takes some power away from the Central Business Architecture Board because previously it just designated one person to make those decisions. And now it's like firing a nuclear missile on a submarine or something like both, both that person <laughs> and the planning director have to agree. Um, so now it's a committee of two people as opposed to one. I'm not saying it's good or bad, I'm saying that's a significant change. Well, it was a staff review, wasn't it? Yeah, so the agent that had been, it was one person, one agent, so one staff person 
was designated as that um, entity to review. So, in fact, I mean, that's an interesting interpretation. We had looked at it, it more than... It looks at it the it, other way, like that somebody from the committee said, we want to be involved with this. We don't want the staff just dismissing these things right. without somebody from the committee being involved. It's like the, the reverse, I think. But as, as I read it, the automated language currently would read, the Central Business Architecture Committee shall appoint a subcommittee or agent and authorize that subcommittee or agent to issue a certificate of etc. Yeah, but that agent was a staff person, wasn't a committee. Right. They had never actually authorized a subcommittee to do the review. It had always been an agent up to this point. So this is sort of tweaking that the the what's confined or who you know who gets yeah. to decide what is on that who is on that subcommittee. But it it does in fact say instead of just having one staff person, this has been practiced since the time this was adopted 20 years ago. Um, let's now that we've had 20 years of experience and some things have gone well, some things oh, haven't yeah, gone so well. 20 years, but yeah. <laughs> so this is really the first change, and sort of looking yeah. at that and saying, well, maybe this this kind of so we've had this experience, maybe we need <coughs> to pull up some of these and have a little bit more review. That was the intention. Yeah. So it's actually the opposite because the staff person always. These were the exempt things. A staff person would look at the building permit and say, well, you don't have to do this, you don't have to do this, you don't have to, you don't have to come to us for this. As a practical matter, it might be the opposite, but the language of it, they could have just appointed themselves. Yeah, oh, I, th I think so. But, but I mean, for, it doesn't bother me if people are replacing windows and stuff after a storm. I'm yeah. just, I'm just, I'm just asking. Mm -hmm. But it, uh, it uh, historically was a. Okay. I still have fond memories of that committee. So. <laughs> You know, the city council actually voted to make me, I was the chair of it for like its first nine years, and the city council actually took action so that I couldn't be a member anymore. I was voted off the island. It's a dark day for North Carolina. Sorry. Oh, well. So questions? Any other questions? And are you the chair now? I am the chair. Do you want to come comment? You, you, you've been staying here, you've got to come comment about this. <laughs> Um, my, my only comment is that this is um, about equity in terms of reviewing projects within the city and making sure that we're asking everyone to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So if the staff likes it and the committee likes it, it can't be all bad. And hopefully the public likes it as well. <laughs> um, anybody else from the public want to comment on this one? This is kind of esoteric, but... Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carolyn, you're going to make it. <laughs> All right, give me just a moment to uh, text counsel or see one. Do you um, have any other questions before you make any of your decisions? Maybe? You have to go anyway. I know, but if you had any burning questions. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Does anybody have any burning questions for Carol? So back to the signs. Mm -hmm. That planning gave that a positive recommendation. Um, yes, with the um, change to instead of having a three square foot sign and a four, okay. just have four across the board. And for your reference, the three square feet is about this, you know those yellow signs we started using for public hearings? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's about three square feet. Okay, so a little bit okay. yeah. What if we just made it square footage? <laughs> You're allowed 10 square feet of signage. <laughs> you can have as many signs as you want. <laughs> Does that include the front and the back of the sign? <laughs> All right. So, and uh, we have Councillor Seawall coming to uh, see us. Let's do a quick look at what is our because the taxi taxi thing is what Alan's coming down for. Let's look. At around to the the rest of these starting with H 
Um, um, so H was referred to community resources, so we're not going to do that today. Okay, so that we're going to we're going to take another day. Right, and then I through N was referred to transportation parking. And those haven't been dealt with there yet. Okay. And then O and P were referred to community resources. As well. That'll do, we did that at last Thursday okay. for those. So, okay, so that page. That cuts it down a bit. Eh, it cuts it down a bit. Okay. So let's, um, because I kind of wanted to bounce a question off Attorney Sewell about the political signs, um, whether political signs. We suggest they be exempt from that. You know, you can only put up, you can put up temporary signs unless they're of political nature, in which case, you know, you can have as many as you want because it's just the way it is. Um, but we can do the cent central architecture one, I think now, but the public hearing is closed because um, there were no really outstanding questions about that one. Uh, what's your feeling about the, about the central business one? Fine, I have a positive recommendation. I have a second for that? I have a second. And it does seem like it was committee driven yeah. mm -hmm. to say don't just be blowing these things away without asking us. So. The chair was here to say so. Yeah, and I think that's an important thing. Yep. Um, and I think a lot of that is is from my time there, you know, the committee's relationship with its staff person and you know, did, are they all on the same page or not? But it appears that perhaps they weren't on a couple of these, and the committee wants to reel back in that decision making. Okay. Um, so I don't have any problem with that. So, any other discussion or concerns about this one? Well, only in that I believe that was referred to community resources. Did that go somewhere else too? So, we might want to hold our. Did that get. Uh, oh, yeah, right. Yeah. With that one too? Community resources. As well. Yes, and that we don't need until uh, the week after next. So I would withdraw my. Unless you want. I forgot it already. Right. We already forgot. So, so uh, is that okay with the seconder that we. Yeah. If that yeah, also yeah. went to committee. I have no idea what you're talking about. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, see, not only is justice blind, legislature is blind. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, now, um, the all of the PV stuff did not go anywhere else, so we could actually correct. So take we could do a, then we could do B through F. Why can't we do A? Well, that was because I'm uh, oh, sorry. We could do A. What's this one? Yeah, they're not. Science. Necessarily in the same order of when our packet is, she presented them, but uh, so A to D and then F and G. A to D and G. So, <laughs> no, just that. Sorry. yeah, they kind of the orders didn't always agree, so we'll flip it over. So, let's see. So, the first one in what do we get? 348. Yeah, 17348 is the first one in our package. Everybody comfortable with that one? Working on that one. This is uh, canopies over parking lots. Planning board said they didn't want it. Just yeah. Planning information. Yeah, no, the planning board said they didn't like the idea, but do you want to advance it with a with no recommendation? I mean, it's in the system, we got to advance it, but show, we don't want to just advance it with no recommendation, and Carolyn will be obviously at the council meeting to <coughs> explain to the entire group what what and why yeah. it's here and why they didn't like it, and let them decide what to do. Yeah, I move on a neutral recommendation. Neutral recommendation. Second. Second on that. Uh, Councilor Nash, you. That sounds good. All right, all in favor of a neutral recommendation, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. All right. And the next one is the one that Mr. Tebow's here for, 17349. This is the one 
allowing photovoltaic arrays in the flood zone. Just want to check my notes. So the planning board recommended on this one that that we strike uh, the location has not been in agricultural production. They recommend we strike that. And uh, the prime architectural land, uh, they wanted to strike that one. Um, what are people's feelings about the limit of eight kilowatts? It seemed, that is kind of small. Do people have any, or do people want to do more research on it? I guess I feel it's more about physical size than isn't that what you're really trying to restrict? Right, because I just said the technology is constantly changing. Yeah. Real question. Yeah, the, the logic of um, limiting its size and its location um, seems a uh, limiting both of those seems, things seem a little unusual to me. You know, because in another ordinance, we're very happy to potentially make them change the orientation of a building for solar in the future, but here, the thing is, you know, is it even big enough to make it economically viable? Yeah, I, I don't understand, I mean, the 100 foot distance restriction, I'm not sure why that's important, frankly, since it's not being used for farm, farming for this period of time. It's and it, well, solar. and it's altogether possible if it's farmland and and, and, and it's in, in an area <coughs> that um, primarily doesn't have structures on it per se because it's farmland, then it may not have pole <laughs> poles either, you know? I mean, they, they don't yeah. tend to run power poles out for, for cucumbers. So it kind of, yeah, we'll let you do it there, but you have to be on the very edge and you can't plant poles. Poles really don't care about floods very much. Um, and you know it's it, it's terribly small and is so limited by location it's sort of we're saying okay you can do it but only small ones and only on the edge because there's if there's no poles out there when I mean, you think of most of the locations these sort of things would go in hey, uh, hey that was quick the word for Beautiful word it is too. Beautiful. One word. of my favorites. Where do you want me? Where, 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 where you want? My thought here is that this is really a an ordinance to allow this to start, rather than you know we're not talking you know that it's kind of a try it out ordinance and see where it goes. It sounds like Mr. Tebow is ready to give it a try. Mm -hmm. And um, it, and eight kilowatts works for you, or? Well, when you talk small scale, large scale, yeah. If you just talk small scale, yeah. Under ten kW. So ten. Okay. And then when you get to that ten kW, the utility has rules. The whole game changes. Oh. Uh, and and the other the other thing about this too is we've, we've lost SREX 1 and 2 that, that made it real feasible mm -hmm. for the people that got in solar early. Next March, that ends in the SMART program that comes in. And if you had a basic small system in, with the new rules, you lose $8,000 right off the bat mm -hmm. on that basic system. So there's going to be less people, there's less incentive as time goes on. Mm -hmm. Do you I mean, I, I'd certainly like to look a little more into this. Um, so I don't, you know, do we send this one with a neutral recommendation as well with the concept that we're gonna look into a little more before it's gonna kind of come up and it'll come up the next council meeting and we'll maybe have a better way to do a better recommendation then. Uh, Cause I'm concerned, I know I share Mr. Tebow's concerns that the 100, the 100 foot seems to be arbitrary as does the eight kilowatt. It seems to be our, just arbitrary numbers that somebody felt good about. I'd like to 
do a little yeah. more research. Can I just get a clarification from Mr. Tebow? Will you be able to build your array with this? No. With, with the rules as proposed. as proposed, does that enable you to do what you want to do? If they're allowing me, no. if they're allowing me to use it for my home, I'm not used. The, the special conservancy zoning now says you have to use the electricity there. But we're talking about if this if this ordinance were law and changed so that you could locate panels to 100 feet of a power line. The 100 feet would probably be a problem. Right. Yeah, so yeah you mentioned you got to get someplace. Uh, you can't put it on your house. You got to put it somewhere else. And right. That's not under. And the other thing is, I I would like to accommodate people like Mr. Tivo, but I would also like to make sure it's a yeah. policy. That's well, why I kind of want to do a little more research on it not before just we tailoring it to right? yeah to right. although it's a salient case that we're very familiar with because we see Mr. Tebow all yeah. the time. But. Yeah. So I well, I well the other thing is is it's getting so close in timing mm -hmm. that with the new program I don't know it's, it takes a lot of incentive away, okay. especially well, at my age <laughs> to to that big investment. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, you're still buying green bananas, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But um, but what what I would like to do if we can send it neutral, do, I'd like to do a little more research, talk to Chris Mason myself about it, and so it'd still come up at the next council meeting. Mm -hmm. It we just wouldn't have made a recommendation one way or the other, and we could take it up at that point. Right. So it's not it's not costing any time. Um, we yeah. do it, so. so I move a neutral recommendation. Second. Right. Any discussion? All in favor? All right. Okay. Um, let's jump up to the sign one since we have Alan here. We're throwing a we're throwing a curveball. But you may have seen this already. Um, this came to us because planning was changing their sign regulations as a result of a court case. I don't know if they ran. I'm hoping they ran that by you, but. What our real question was is they, you know, in some places they homogenized it a little bit, but our concern was that they limit you to two signs at a time, but those signs also, that also covers political signs. And our concern was if you were a politically active person that wanted to put the signs for four or five candidates in your front yard, Theoretically, the ordinance says that, you know, they limit the size, but they also say uh, in residential zoning districts, two temporary less than 90 day, and there's no exemption for political signs from the two. So if you wanted to support four or five candidates that, you know, you'd be out there rotating the sides so you never had more than two. And the question I have for you is, you know, do we exempt the number of political signs? You know, obviously, you know, a contractor sign or a plumber sign or this sign or that sign is one thing. Right. But political signs are sort of of a different nature. Carolyn basically said that the, the whole point of making these changes was so that they, they, they shouldn't be in the business of distinguishing what kind of sign is what, whether it's political or mm -hmm. business or whatever. Well, but the First Amendment certainly <laughs> makes distinctions between <laughs> The types of signs. Commercial signs are treated quite differently than political signs. Um, and so uh, I'd be happy to take a look at it. Uh, I haven't seen this before. Okay. This is the first time that anybody's run this by me, so um, I would because like to take a look. It's based on a Supreme Court decision. Well, they, <laughs> with regards to restricting the content of, I mean, a lot of it was size and content and so forth. But it didn't seem that they could lump political signs in with signs for the guy who's doing a roof for a plumber. I, I understand Carolyn's concern that the content of a sign should not in any way be uh, a factor in whether the sign is allowed. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, a three by f uh, you know, three by four sign is a three by four sign no matter what it says on it. And um, so uh, the, the court looks very dimly on anything that attempts to regulate the content of speech. T 
time, place, and manner are the sort of the, are the buzzwords for First Amendment regulation. You can reasonably regulate the time, place, and manner of speech, uh, but content is a no-no. Now, the question of whether it is protected speech is a whole different, a whole different question because because uh, political speech is given far more protection than commercial speech. But, uh, but what, what the commercial speech says, uh, you know, we had an ordinance in Amherst years ago that prohibited gas stations from posting their prices. And, you know, and one of the uh, uh, gas companies said, to them, we have a first amendment right to put our, you know, our prices up, and they were right. They do have, there is commercial speech. There, but political speech is much more, high, more highly valued in our uh, under the First Amendment. So I would have to look at this. Okay. And, um, I'm not going to. Uh, so shall we continue this one to our? Also, it there, right now there is a restriction that you can only have one sign per candidate or cause. Right. This also takes that out, so you can only have two signs. They could be for the same candidate. Okay. So I assume by what you're saying that you would be okay with that because you don't want to limit you. You don't want to restrict someone's speech, so if they want to, on, on their two signs proclaim, or however many signs proclaim, right. um, their support of someone. They right, two signs for one candidate. I don't, you get two signs, it, you really, we, we shouldn't be regulated what's on that sign, right. on either of the signs. Right. So this is a very difficult, these are difficult waters to navigate. It also shouldn't have the effect, you know, it's unintended of restricting the number of, of signs. I don't, I've always been a little uncomfortable even with the 90 day, take your sign down after 90 day requirements. Well, it's just such a hassle for me, I have to drive around town. Mm -hmm. um, but in all seriousness, it, it seems like something that's self-regulating to me. It's like getting your, like I said before you got here, it's kind of like getting your neighbor to cut their grass. You can have an ordinance, you can try and have the city enforce everyone cutting the grass, but at the end of the day, it's more like, I go over to my next door neighbor and I say, can you please cut your grass or, or take those those signs down? That seems to be how you would regulate political speech. It makes me a little uncomfortable right. when we start that. What you're happen. saying is you're regulated by not regulating it. And, and I also point out, you know, we have like, you can drive around and still see lawn signs. That people keep on their lawn, maybe because their candidate didn't win, it's a kind of protest that's because it's speech. Maybe tacky, maybe ugly, maybe cluttered, but so I, I tend to right, agree with the for, sure. for the city or town does have the right to prevent clutter, yeah. like the things that that you know these ordinances. I mean, these ordinances have developed over the years not because we don't want speech, but it's because it is cluttered and people consider it ugly and whatever. If you ever drive over from South Hadley to Hoyoke, right at that point, the bridge is one guy whose house always has an enormous line sign. Clearly, it's not would not be allowed in Northampton, and in Northampton, we wouldn't be happy with that. But when you think about what's what's wrong with it, you know, it may be it may not look good, but anyway. So, mm -hmm. so would you like to continue this one to give Councilor Seawall a chance to uh, get his thoughts clear on this? So, a motion. Um, Second. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Okay. All right. Is this a copy that I can keep? That could be your signature copy. Okay. I don't think I prove I was here. <laughs> All right, uh, the next one is uh, 17350, the solar ready one, um, with regards to uh, if you're going for site plan review for additions. Um, and I'm still really uncomfortable with roof orientation. Um, I don't mind the other stuff that the roof, when you design, you know, this is one of the when you go for site plan review for a um, new building or a substantial addition that um, they want to make sure that even if you don't install solar, you've taken it into consideration like the roof would support it mm -hmm. for a future owner or something, or that there's a place for ground mounted and you've taken that into consideration. The one part that I don't like is they talk about, the, the sentence goes, uh, this is meant by showing that the roof design can support solar panels and that roof orientation and conduit electrical service to be incorporated so that installation can be easily accomplished later on. Um, 
I'm just concerned that with roof orientation, the planning board would start to tell people which way their building had to face on a site. Uh, and again, this is for site plan review. I don't mind if they make if, if they want to make sure that the roof will hold it, or that there is wiring capable of powering it. But to tell you how to orient the building in your site plan review seems a little intrusive. And what kind of uses are we talking about? Are these um, commercial uses? Primarily because it's site plan review, which is usually yeah. substantial buildings. Yeah. It's very, you know, it's not often houses. And it's really, I keep thinking it's up to the the user of the site and and the architects as to where the, which is the best way to configure the building on the site, given its topography and its egresses and all that other stuff. Right. And I think the, what planning is, is trying to say is that that we're trying to elevate provision of on-site power uh, to a level that it is at now, which approaches access. I mean, obviously, if you if we can't orient it, uh, let, me, let me step back. Site plan review is is not uh, a question of whether the use is going to be allowed. These are allowed uses. And so um, this is an, an, an effort to tweak it to make it better from the planner's view. Um, and so um, requiring orientation to the extent possible that, takes, that, that makes solar available is, I think, completely consistent with what my experience of, <coughs> of site plan review has been. Um, they tell developers where to put things and how to put things in site plan approval all the time and that's just my experience uh, because why bother making the 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 roof able to support solar panels if you're not going to orient the building in a way that you can take advantage of, of solar power I mean you know perhaps there ought to be uh, that you know not requiring um, fortifying the roof so as to allow for solar panels uh, where there's you know there's no orientation that could take advantage of solar energy uh, but I, it seems to be completely consistent with my experience of site plan review to sort of promote the things that the planners want to see in future buildings mm -hmm. what's everyone else's feeling am i the only one who has a problem with it i i agree with your Concerns and that um, that uh, you know, I Carolyn mentioned the word you know that planning that you know that it be considered and that um, I mean if you change the orientation of the building to accommodate solar, well there goes your garden. You know it's like it's not <laughs> or, or there goes where the kids' play structure was going to go or that's where you know the you know for a bigger project that could have been where the public space was going to be you know and. So that um, I think I'm, I'm fine with it as long as, you know, did you look at this? Did you consider this? I think having the requirement that the, the roof be, you know, strong enough to support, I mean, I, I would imagine that, you know, supporting solar on a roof is pretty much the same as supporting, you know, asphalt shingles. <laughs> it can't be that much different. Um, but that, um, but I, I think requiring that would, would that would be fine. But. I, I think that in terms of you know the way sites are oriented the, and um, and the different uses you want to have on the ground that those things need to be you know it needs to be like yeah we thought about it mm -hmm. we just didn't think it was effective for this site. Yeah. I think my analogy was you know let's say somebody orients the building for the spectacular view from this corner of the site but gets told no you have to put it over here because you can't get some over there but you can't get some. Over we're talking about large commercial structures here. We're not talking about people's homes. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're talking about. Any more? I, this doesn't bother me at all. I'd be more helpful if we're talking about single family homes. Or. But what goes to site plan? Isn't it like four units or four units or more? It's, so it could be. It's, tri it's triggered by the size, or frankly, it's triggered by a 2,000 square foot addition. So what's the size that triggers? So 2,000 square foot addition, that's pretty big. That would, that would, that would trigger it. And I mean, there are locational issues for, you know, you, you, this, restaurants like nice views too for their patios and things. So it, it could be, it would be of concern. 
I just hate, would hate to see it become a real sticky wicket at some point in time where, you know, people really do, planning board really does want to redesign a project. Because they, they can't, I, I, if you're not putting on solar, this doesn't seem to be able to make you put on solar. Just simply leave the provisions for solar. So they can make you move your building even though you're not going to put solar on it anytime soon. Or if ever, or if ever. But it still can get moved over here for the anticipation of it at some point. I remember a day when when we didn't have uh, lot coverage percentages. Nobody thought about you know impermeable surfaces, and it was the planners who started pushing, you know, to limit impermeable surfaces so we wouldn't have so much runoff. Uh, this is the way society progresses, and the truth is. I can foresee a time when being able to provide on-site power is going to be like being able to provide heat. Uh, you know, having a furnace. You have to have it, or the site's not buildable. I mean, that's something that, that planners may be planning for someday, and they <coughs> want buildings oriented to take advantage of. Well, what if you view it as like a utility, right? So if, you, if you're planning a site, you need to figure out where to plan it to tap into the utilities. This is sort of a you know, driveway access. Your only way to get that utility. I've seen planning boards move driveway accesses that completely have to redesign the access to the building because we don't want a curb cut here. We want a curb cut there. Mm -hmm. That's what site plan's all about. But then again, if you guys are uncomfortable with it, it's a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I'm very, I'm very happy to have this discussion at the council. You know, we don't have to, because I think, uh, you know, I have sometimes you get to esoteric in committees. I think there's often a comment that comes at full council. So um, I'm happy to accept any motion on this. Since we're not making any decisions today, I'm with a neutral recommendation <laughs> on this. So. Okay, second. You okay with that? Yeah. All in favor? Yeah. Aye. Um, do you want to, um, shall we be uh, tying to Councillor Seawall and yeah. move along to the, the reason? by calling the counselor. <laughs> counselor. Counselor. Solicitor. Please. Solicitor to me. Um, we'll move on. If there's no objections. We'll move on to taxis and get uh, Solicitor Seawall out of here. Well, I uh, made the changes that were based upon, except for one, I realized that I put in 100,000 in uh, property damage coverage, and you guys had talked about 50. But other than that, I think I've done what you asked. Uh, I don't know that a decision's been made on uh, how large the vehicles are to be. Uh, what's the capacity for a taxi? We had, uh Community resources, we had said um, eight. Eight vehicles? Uh, yeah, eight. Or eight persons. Eight, eight, yeah. Eight, right. Of average size. Right. Eight passengers. Eight passengers. And in reviewing other cities' ordinances, that I saw that elsewhere. Okay. So, let's see. Yeah, that could be deleted. This. Um, yeah. So it's not going to it's not going to be manu manufacturers re recommended capacity. It's going to be eight big passengers. So. Yeah, I wish I had that language. I think it should have been in the email you sent me. Changes that were made at community resources, I thought were incorporated into uh, what Alan sent around, but 
now I'm concerned that maybe you didn't get that it's in the back of it. She sent me an email on um, August 13th, maybe. Looks like. With a copy of the order? Yes. Because this still had the same language, manufacturers recommend seating capacity language in it. I think that's meant to be vehicle specific, meaning that some vehicles can only handle five passengers, or some would handle seven or six. So manufacturers recommend it means you won't put eight people in a cab that sits six. But what we're doing is putting a limit on how big cabs can but be. How big the cabs can be, I understand that. So they can't go over eight passengers. But each vehicle, they're meaning it's for the per number of seat belts in the vehicle. I think that would be that what that word referred to. What are we trying to accomplish here? The so number of the limiting the cab, the biggest cab that can possibly go. Correct. Is it in the definition? It say no cab shall accommodate more than. It says um, a metered, hardwired, or GPS smartphone app motor vehicle with a seating capacity not to exceed eight. What, what I put in there was eight passengers, not to exceed eight passengers. We don't need eight or fewer. Okay, great. No. Okay. I was, and just natural, I was matching it to delivery. Yeah, okay. eight passengers. Now, with regard to the manufacturer's recommended seating capacity, everybody's got to have a seat belt, so you can't put right. more than Yeah, that. whatever the car We're set up. The size of the vehicle, not so over. Right. And then the next, the next thing was the uh, insurances. <coughs> About two fifty five hundred, but that was the information K. that I got from Peter Whalen. And then the property in injury was twenty five, and in here it's a hundred, but the note says fifty. The email I realized the email that Pam sent me said that you all had talked about in, in community, community. We did, and then I said that I would do further research, which was what I sent you. That spreadsheet of what right. other the communities that I looked at and sort of all over the map. So I have it right here. Right. Um, I just want to say that it, it, as part of your, yeah, as part of the email from Pam, she sent me excerpt of the minutes from community resources right. meeting. And the community to the. Okay. 
she talks about fifty thousand for damage to property. You know, again, I mean, fifty thousand is really minimal. So, did, are you saying that in the minutes that she included the excerpt of it, that either that that's not what your recommendation is then, or that um, it might just be that that's what the minutes are wrong? Yeah, I, I may have made a recommendation for fifty thousand for damages, but I didn't recall doing that. And I typically put in a hundred thousand for property damage. Okay. Um, get a couple of parked cars and a and a telephone pole, and you've exceeded your fifty thousand. So your recommendation is two fifty five hundred and a hundred thousand. Right. That would be my recommendation. And that's what's in here now. That's, that's what's what, in here now. That's what I, I put it in now. And Excellent. as I said, based on my research. It's all over the place. So there's not sort of a set standard. Right. That's mm -hmm. right. Let me just say that these are minimal amounts for any commercial activities. This, you know, mm -hmm. 250, 500, yeah. but it's usually a million, three million. Although Beverly is a million. Mm -hmm. I know that's something that I recommend. Mm -hmm. People uh, right in my office don't, don't carry less than this if you're driving clients around. Uh, any business. Mm -hmm. Any business, any commercial activity that you know engages with the public should have at least a million, three million in insurance. But we're not going to do that. I haven't been able to find that cabs are can can get that much insurance. Uh, so he's recommending the maximum that Peter wanted. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so what we're looking for is a minimal. Well, it's yeah. the, it's maximum. Maximum. It's the minimum the that they can carry. It's the maximum that they can yeah. get. So. <laughs> Perfect. Is that going to carry over delivery? So does that mean delivery insurance? What is their insurance? I mean, where does that stand? It's not even mentioned. And this doesn't cover delivery, correct? This is just taxis. And they carry a lot more people. It says that these are permit requirements for vehicles, not specifically. Oh. Um. Delivery on, uh, well, there's no pages on this, but. Um, <clears throat> Seventeen two six five. Uh, yeah, so it does have. But the delivery vehicle was the one that has the appointment. They don't pick up on call, they have to have an appointment. But that wouldn't make a difference if you had two cars in the telephone call. Okay, I think this applies to both. Yeah, it does. The, the difference being that delivery, uh, delivery vehicles should be hired on a pre-arranged basis only with a minimum 12 hour notice, shall not pick up on demand fares, uh, shall not have exterior vehicle markings, taxi or cab. Shall not contain rate meters. Uh, have a pre -com a, a pre completed scheduled trip sheet and blah 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 blah. blah. Um, that's under markings, but I think they have the same requirements. But at the end of the day, it's still a vehicle on the road that could cause yeah. the same. Yeah. So they have the yeah. same insurance requirements as the taxi. Mm -hmm. They do. Yeah. Does this also cover the co taxis that are picking up out from outside towns that are picking up in Northampton? They need to have only the ones we license. We can, we can only regulate the ones we license. Okay. So you want to alienate the cabs that are existing in Northampton for cabs that are based out of other towns? Well, theoretically, they're not supposed to be picking up fares here if they're not licensed here. They can drop fares off. But, but they no, that's they're allowed to pick up here. I mean, if they're picking up here now. Are they going to be required to carry that same amount of insurance if they're picking up here in the future? With liveries. Or cab, cabs. Because you have cabs from East Hampton that pick up here on a regular basis. I mean, they're a, they're a staple in the community, so. Isn't our intent to prevent that? No, we talked about that last, last time I was here, that this is only about 
the cabs we like. Cab companies that are based in Northampton, this is not, in, you know, as I said last time, you could regulate out of town cabs picking up here, but Northampton has never chosen to do that, and I didn't think that, this, that, that the committee had chosen to do that. So then for amendments to this that I have made note of, um, we define a cab as having a capacity not to exceed eight. I think the insurances are correct the way you have them in here, based okay. on our discussion for that. Um, and um, the oh. other smoke, the smoking policy has yes. also changed to match match general law. Exactly. The reference to that. It's prohibited at any time in a cab. Okay. Whether there is a, a, a passenger in there or not. I don't think that's Mass General Law. Um, ba -ba -ba there was a note about the mayor and his designee. We worked that one out right because we can't mm -hmm. compel the good mayor to do things. And I think those were the only ones. So really the eight. The capacity of eight was the only amendment left to be done here. So, do we have time for a motion on this? I move the recommendation. As amended with the eight. Eight capacity. Yeah. yeah. We have a second for that. There we go. Any more discussions? Then, uh, all in favor of a positive recommendation. Please say aye. Opposed? All righty. Do we need a solicitor? I've been corrected. Solicitor Seawall for any of our other business? I don't hear anybody beg or to say. Is there something else I need to look at? Other, other zoning? The only, the only other. What's that other one you were talking about? Which one was that? Oh, the, uh, the site plan approval. What was he hoping Oh, the site plan approval one. Um, we were going to. Oh, that's the one you have. We have sign. It's not all of them are in here. Oh, they're that's all in the here. whole thing. Okay. So you've got them all. Um, we were going to send that one, um, okay. the site plan thing, with a neutral, neutral recommendation and duke it out at council. So you, if you read it and have like an epiphany or something, let us know. <laughs> when is the council meeting? A week from Thursday. It's a while away. <laughs> You're coming out of vacation mode. Three weeks. Three weeks. Right. And so and this week is just I imagine everything you're waiting for. So, there's do my best. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well the strikeouts, we 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 also mm -hmm. kinda like when they get here that they don't have three different versions of strikeouts and planning stuff. It would be nice if it was clear what we get right, to. Right. Yeah. I think what planning needs to do is to like do all their in, internal strikeouts and then create a clean document for you guys to get. Mm -hmm. And then you guys start again on the strikeouts and additions. Sometimes these things are so impossible to read. So Yeah, you can we get three different strikeout versions. This is from planning board, this is from here, this is from there. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. We're streaking towards conclusion here. Let's see. We got uh, so we did. Uh, sorry here. So as far as the uh, we did uh, seventeen three fifty. We did seventeen three fifty two. We did three forty eight. So three fifty. So 253 uh, is the uh, is eliminating the permit for offsite parking for educational uses. Does anybody have a no, class recommendation? Second. Okay. Seems that's what the that planning law, zoning law requires. Mm -hmm. All right. Any more discussion on this one? All in favor of positive recommendation, please say aye. 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 And then um, we got, oh, did we do? Three 
351. We did uh, 349. Did we do the um, the floodplain? Yeah, the floodplain one we did, and that was neutral. 351. And so 351 remains to be done. This is large scale photovoltaics. Um, and this is one that treats it as, is to treat it as a private utility substation. What are people's feelings about that? I'm not going to lie that I'm not 100% what that implies. Understanding what that means. <laughs> I, I, they, and I have to say, I don't recall either, because I'm pretty familiar with the zoning ordinance, but I've never dealt with zoning relative to utility substation. Yeah. So I don't know what the implications of that are, or is. I'd like to think something more than just size would trigger to be a public utility substation. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if they, they um, consider them Mr. Tebow still here, do you know? Or you probably well, don't do utility well, stuff. I'm, I'm confused why they, I looked at that and looked at that. Yeah, because normally you have small scale and yeah. large scale. Yeah. Yeah, and this, there. It, it says such, if it's 250 kilowatts uh, DC, such a system is considered a use classified as a private utility substation or a similar facility in the table of uses, if not otherwise specifically set. I'd um, love to continue. It, continue this I'd one? I'd love to continue this one. I don't see what the urgency is. I, I don't really it, see. It, it could possibly be the only, the only familiar thing that I would say that that's probably from a national grid or from a utility. From a utility, utility company. how they classify. Yeah, because it's, and it's also, it's also DC. Now, how many DC substations are there? There, there are DC substations. You know, the, the only DC you really have that's big is, is uh, the Hydro-Quebec power that comes in and that's converted to AC. Right. Yeah, I mean, so it's used for transmission, but right. if you're going around the Pantha and you see a substation, it's not DC. No, but, but uh, the only thing is, is a lot of your, uh, Solar produces DC and then it's rectified in AC. Right. Yeah, but that it, but, so it, it but, comes down DC, but then you make it AC. Right. So, but I don't, I don't know. I think it's, it's weird because if it's I don't know what it is. That, that's what I'm thinking about. It's a classified private utility substation. That's why. That's why my question was directed uh, when I asked her about the landfill of the size of it. What I meant is that substation. Yeah, I'm moving to continue. You bite on that? Second. Second. Any more discussion on this one? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so, and we did do, um, did we, did we vote on the one we were talking to Alan about? We sent it with a neutral, did we send it with a neutral recommendation, the one relative to the roof orientation? Neutral. Neutral, okay. I just want to make sure we did that. Yeah, we're going to talk to Chris and get a little more information. On, on, yeah. Well, no, the one I want to talk to Chris about was the one with the eight kilowatt limit on the uh, floodplain ones. All right. So that went neutral, and then all of the other, the other ones on the agenda, the other items on our agenda, uh, you want to just vote to continue them as a group pending action by. Community resources, that's where they pretty much all are, right? It's community well, resources or transportation department. Yeah. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Good. Um, so thank you, Mr. Tebow, for being here to uh, advise us and answer our questions. Well, you know, I've been going to a lot of meetings lately. And the thing is, the thing is, is if you don't show up in a meeting and it's something you're interested in, you don't know which way it's going to go. You don't have any input in it. And, and with you people, and I've seen whether it's a, like the planning board meeting with the planning person coming in and giving it, the question they, they've asked too, where some of, these, some of this stuff is denied, but a lot of it is, was input from me. 
-hmm. So if I wasn't there, mm -hmm. you don't know which way it's going to go. Mm -hmm. It's just like if I didn't answer some questions tonight, and you went just by the planning person, you'd probably make the decision that goes with what they want. Could you Not give the postman for civic engagement for us? <laughs> <laughs> I think you need a lobbyist <laughs> registration law. <laughs> well, and, and also what's nice about this setting is we can go back and forth. I mean, the, when you get to council, the die sort of cast. You get your three minutes, and you can't have a conversation. Where here, you know, we can chat with you, and you know, even outside the public hearing setting, if we choose to have a little give and take and get some information, we can. So, it's in the envelope. Do you, do you have, wait a minute, Councillor Nash has something on. Two, two things. I want to thank Councillor Shiar for the research she did around the taxis. taxis. And, and all of the work she did there, that was great. And I want to thank both Councillor Murphy and Councillor Shiar for taking what was a huge agenda and turning it into a, a meeting where we actually got a lot done. And so thank you. Yeah, really, there's only. Well, you guys work together to, you know, narrow things down to what was manageable. There really is a. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the taxi, the taxi thing will always be a child of community resources. <laughs> and Mr. Miller did jump up the window. So. Uh, I move to adjourn. I already, I already did that. Oh, okay. I then you she, then you seconded it. Your second was interrupted by Councilor. Well, that was discussion. That was discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all.